Um, I've already been introduced. I'm former Ward 5 Counselor Beatriz Gomez Moacan, uh, also known as Bea. Um, I've been a longtime Somerville resident. Also, one of my proudest moments is being a member of a group called Padres Latinos, the Somerville Public Schools. Happy to talk to you about this group if you don't know it. Uh, and I'm really, um, I want to thank both uh, our incumbent and our challenger for being here. It's, it's really amazing to have two women here present for this position. As a woman who has been in office, I thank you. And I also know how hard it is to run for office. Uh, so please, everybody, treat these women with immense respect. It takes a lot. And I ask you to speak from the heart um, is, is, as a former politician. That's what we need in politics. And always think we're all part of a greater whole. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Rand Wilson. I'm a longtime union organizer. I'm a champion for local hire here in Somerville because we want to have our residents get the good jobs that they deserve in our own community. I'm a member of the Jobs uh, Creation and Retention Trust, uh, a fund that was created uh, to promote workforce development here in the community. And I'm a convener for Somerville Stands Together, a community labor and environmental coalition working for good jobs and affordable housing in our community. Um, now I'm going to ask, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. I'm going to ask our candidates to introduce themselves, and they're going to keep to the times tonight because we have Tegan as our timekeeper, and she will be uh, making sure that everybody keeps to the times, and for, for the introductions, we're going to allow each candidate two minutes, and I'm going to turn to Kathleen to open it up. Kathleen? Thank you. Um, my name is Kathleen Hornby. I want to start by thanking the Somerville Democratic City Committee for hosting, um, Jack especially, for bringing us all together tonight, despite the pizza, uh, Bea and Rand for moderating, and Representative Eiderhoven for, for joining us. And for everyone who's come out here, uh, this is a great turnout, and it's really exciting to see this much interest in this campaign. Um, back in 2005, I got to know Somerville by doing exactly what I've been doing every day of this campaign, knocking on doors and making calls and talking to voters. I fell in love with this city and I chose to build a life here. First as a renter starting in 2006 and now as someone fortunate enough to own a home. I met my husband at a party in Somerville, uh, convinced him to move here. We got married here and our kids go to school in this building. Over the years, I volunteered where and when I could and to help my neighbors in need because I'm invested in making sure that this community thrives. I'm also invested in using public policy to help improve people's lives. In the years that I spent working for two state representatives, I helped draft hundreds of bills and budget amendments on everything from shelter access to reproductive rights to gun violence prevention. I also recruited, trained, and mentored dozens of staff and interns. I'm running to be our next state representative because I want to dedicate my experience, skills, and network to ensuring that Somerville is getting everything we can from the State House. I look forward to telling you more about my vision for Somerville and how it will better represent you through the course of this debate. Thank you. Erica? Good evening. Thank you all so much for being here and engaging on state and local issues. Thank you to the Somerville Dems, Jack, our moderators, and Kathleen uh, for being here as well as the Somerville Media Center for organizing this debate. My name is Erica Eiderhoven. I serve as your state representative here in Somerville, fighting for progressive values and fighting for a government that works for the many, not the few. Serving this community has been an honor of my lifetime because of everything we've accomplished together. This includes taxing the rich to fix and invest in the MBTA, investing billions of dollars in affordable housing and public housing, and expanding access to abortion and reproductive freedom. I've dedicated my life to dismantling structural racism, eliminating wealth and income inequality, ending mass incarceration, and building up the power of unions and organized labor. Every day, I work to build coalitions and with you all to deliver on these core values. I'm running for re-election because this district deserve, deserves and these times require fierce and unrelenting leadership. I'm running because I know we have the power to build on the wins that we've already won and accomplished together. 
That means debt for higher education, equitably funding our K through 12 schools, Medicare for all in Massachusetts, and fighting for a truly affordable housing and protecting tenants through fair policies, including rent stabilization. Here in Massachusetts, we have and must continue to lead the nation with our values, with actions, and not just words. I'm a movement organizer, coalition builder, and problem solver, and I believe that together we can build a world where each and every one of us can live with dignity and respect. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, thank you. And right now we'll start a, a question and answer session. The way we are structuring it, I will start. <coughs> Sorry, I thought I was loud. Um, we will start by, uh, we'll alternate candidates who goes first. Ran and I will alternate questions. Each candidate has 90 seconds uh, to respond. Um, and Ran will leave it at those uh, just answers due to time constraints. Yeah, I got to be louder. Sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll scream as hard as I can, except I just had a cold and I might start coughing. So I apologize. So each candidate has 90 seconds to answer the question, and we're going to alternate between candidates who starts first to have an even distribution. Um, I'll start with the first question. Um, many voters are to, unsure. To Erica. To Erica, sorry. Many voters are unsure what the office you are uh, you are each seeking or have entails. Would would you please explain to voters what a state rep does? Absolutely. So what I do as a state legislator is I'm your voice and representative on Beacon Hill. I push for and advocate for policies that move our progressive vision forward. The agenda that I've put forth and that you all have voted for in the past uh, two election cycles is what I fight for on Beacon Hill. Um, and that includes things around you know, anything state level. So just to kind of separate, we're that middle child in between local government and federal government. Um, and so what we work on, a lot of things around school funding, healthcare funding, uh, supporting our cities. As we know, the local municipalities uh, are limited because largely you can only raise funding through property taxes. So a lot of state aid and budget conversations are a big part of our work. Um, we also manage various aspects of the state administration and holding that administration accountable. Just because you pass legislation doesn't mean it actually gets enacted the way we intended. So a lot of my work is particularly on uh, ensuring that our prisons are held accountable and the criminal legal system works as it should because that is all at the state level with the exception of some of the federal you know, part of the, that part, the puzzle. So um, that is a really big part. Uh, the other piece I'll say too is that um, we also craft the laws that um, within the limitations of what is going on at the federal level that we can move. So for example, a lot of what we've had to do is respond to the Supreme Court justice's rulings, particularly on reproductive freedom, shelter, immigration, and, and various other issues like that. So um, that's my answer. Thank you so much. Kathleen, what does a state rep do? Thanks, Rand. Um, we were talking about this earlier. As a state rep, I like to think of it as like 311 for this district in the state house. You call when you have a problem and you're not sure what the, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's who you call when you have a problem and you don't know where to go. And ideally, when you call that office, they connect you with the services you need. Some, and that's usually me answering the call as a staffer and that informs all of my work. So constituent services are a big part of this, helping people get their unemployment benefits, helping people who are at risk of immediate, um, being immediately unhoused, helping people access services um, from, so they don't become unhoused. Also advancing policy based on those conversations. Every conversation I have had with a constituent or a voter informs my policy decisions and every good legislator approaches policy the same way. You bring your values, you bring your agendas, and you base it on the conversations you're hearing from folks on the ground. That's also true for funding through the state to local organizations that directly serve people. And it is the state re representative's responsibility to bring funding back to their districts to help the most vulnerable members of their communities. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, here's another softball question, and I promise the next ones will be a little harder. Give us, as you know, people wanting to get to know you, give us three things that you would like the, uh, your constituents, the audience here tonight, 
uh, and voters to know about you? Uh, so three things. One, what brought me into political activism was being part of my high school GSA, and I was a Gay Straight Alliance. I was very, very fortunate to have a really supportive, energetic, and active Gay Straight Alliance in my high school. We marched in Boston for safe schools for GLBTQ plus kids. I wrote letters to my editor, and I wrote to my state representatives to advocate for equal marriage. And that's how I found out who uh, Kay Khan and Cindy Cream were, and I ended up working with them later in the State House. So those values have been my North Star in the rest of my political activism. Um, I'm also a parent, as I mentioned, and it has been an incredibly humbling experience for me. It taught me how to ask for help, how to recognize my limitations, and it has also broadened my horizons, especially in Somerville, by connecting me with members of this community I wouldn't have had a chance to meet otherwise. Uh, third, I am a big nerd. I describe myself as a policy wonk, um, and I love it. So any spreadsheet you see uh, that we give out or have on the website is a small, very condensed version of the extensive spreadsheets that I live and breathe throughout my years of work at the State House. I love doing this work. I want to keep doing this work. Um, it's what drives me. Erica, what three things you would like community to know sure. about you. Um, I'll share three things. The first is that um, I was very lucky to have grown up in a union household. Uh, my mom was a flight attendant for TDWA and she was actually on strike when I was uh, in her womb and I seen the years and decades of the way corporate America has hollowed out the American worker and our, our labor. Oh, thank you. I'll be louder. Can people hear me? <laughs> Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I think that's a big piece that drives a lot of my work. So, uh, for example, the, one of the biggest things I'm most proud of is the number of strikes and public sector strikes that are happening across the state, which is why I filed the bill to restore the public sector's uh, workers' rights to strike, and that is particularly crucial here in Somerville with what's happening to our Somerville DPW. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is... Um, I grew up as an Asian American, uh, daughter of immigrants. I've seen how the public and, and particularly government institutions render people like my mom and myself invisible. And that's something that is really core to what guides my work today, is the fact that there are so many injustices out there where people are rendered invisible. And that's part of what has drawn me to fighting for the criminal legal system, ensuring that people who are incarcerated, who are the most invisible people in our society, are made visible and that their voices are heard. And the last thing I'll share is that um, I get to continue the work that I've been doing as an advocate for almost a decade. I fought for more transparency and accountability in the state government. That's something that we've been able to actually make changes step by step, and I think that is one of the reasons why we have that on the ballot in November, and I'm very excited to continue that work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, here's another question. Some journalists, journalists speak of Beacon Hill as having a system. How would you describe the system and how do you see your place in it? So I will share that Beacon Hill is a very non-transparent and inaccessible place. Um, and that's, for me, I believe that as your state representative and legislator, it is my role to make that less transparent, more accessible, and more accountable, and something that you can easily engage in. Um, and we saw that with the end of session, right? Um, this is something that the Boston Globe described as the end of session logjam. Um, the process is very difficult to understand, and a lot of decisions are made behind closed doors without any oversight of the public. My role in this is that not only do I need to fight for the issue at hand. Those issues rely on us having more transparency and accountability in that system. Um, that is why we're having trouble passing more ambitious climate laws, because those decisions get behind, decide behind closed doors. So I push for both of those prongs around pushing for those issues and advocating for them, as well as making sure that we actually change the conditions and the rules of how the state house operates. The last piece I'll add is that as your state rep, there are things I can do on an individual level, right, to increase that transparency and make it more accessible to you. That's why I have regular office hours with my colleagues in municipal and state and federal government. So you can ask those questions that you're not just told that's a federal issue, that's a municipal issue, that's not our issue. You get that answered wholesale from us, as well as making sure that you understand what is going on and that we are actually uh, communicating that to the district, whether it's through text, email, um, and all that. Kathleen? answer the same question. How would you describe the system and your place in it? 
Beacon Hill, it's a system, and I have seen this become more and more the case over the years I've worked there, of consolidated power and incredible inertia. It's so frustrating to spend two years working on a bill only to have it die at midnight on July 31st, or as we've seen the last two sessions, at 10 a.m. on July 32nd. <laughs> State has time. Um, so as a staffer, my role was to understand how to navigate that system and deliver for, at that point, Cambridge residents, because I was working for two Cambridge reps. Now I'm running to deliver for Somerville residents and to push for the reforms that do need to happen on Beacon Hill while continuing to make sure that I'm meeting my constituents' immediate needs. Because what we have seen so far has not been effective in making the, the legislature more transparent, my approach would be, and this is gonna be a big lift, restructuring the committee system so that members elect their own chairs. Right now, with leadership appointing the chair positions and the, providing the stipends that go along with them, we can't get anything done. And it's going to take a wholesale restructuring of that system in order to really make the change that we need to see to have an effective functioning legislature. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Kathleen. Erica. <clears throat> You've had a very close view of the House of Representatives as an incumbent. Mm -hmm. Please name two of the strengths of the House of Representatives and two of what you perceive to be its main weaknesses. Yeah. So um, I would say the biggest strengths are also some of the weaknesses. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the strengths of the legislature is that we have elected progressive legislators. And as such, right, when we have things like Supreme Court justice rulings to strike down our right to abortion, we move swiftly to do that, even though it is done largely behind closed doors and that the power is consolidated. That is one strength. Another strength is that um, we have actually a lot of power in this room and with the people on the ground because it's so lacking of transparency, which is a weakness, there's a lot of opportunity for you all to put leverage and power and pressure on that system. A lot of legislators are shocked when they hear how much engagement I have with this district because they're not used to hearing from their constituents. So I say that's actually a strength because that gives you all the power to work with your networks across the state and put pressure on the system. And that is exactly what we do with unions, with advocacy groups across the state, and even with currently and formerly incarcerated people who are organizing across the state to push for those issues and they can make those pushes because the legislature is not used to hearing from you all, ex with a few exceptions like this district. Um, the last thing I'll say in terms of a weakness is the consolidation of power. Um, we need to break that really consolidated power. I don't think it's going to be solved by just having more conversations with uh, leadership. We do need to change the rules and how the system works for that to change. Thank you. Um, be louder. Uh, I'm hearing a, a lot of people can't hear. So. Uh, Please name two strengths and two weaknesses that you perceive of our state legislature. Well, in my years of working as a staffer in the State House, what keeps me coming back after being frustrated, disillusioned time and time again is being surrounded by all of the people who work long hours for barely livable wages, including often through the night and over the weekends, because they care so deeply about making a difference. It is truly an honor to work among these staff members and legislators, but really the people in the building who show up who aren't trying to make a name for themselves, who just want to make people's lives better, it's one of the best things about working in the State House. Um, another strength, again, the State House serving as a role model for the rest of the country. This includes protecting access to abortion and gender affirming care, which we were proud to do after Roe fell. This includes leading in gun violence prevention, which we continue to do and encourage other states to follow our lead. And also, historically, equal marriage and health care. Massachusetts has been leading and demonstrating to the rest of the country what real progressive leadership looks like. Uh, weaknesses, again, we're going to keep using the same words. It's inaccessible. It's inaccessible to the public. It's inaccessible to potential staff who 
who have to often know the right person in order to find a job and have to be able to afford to live on those wages. And it's inaccessible to potential legislators who have to go through the expense and time of campaigning. And it's also, as we have discussed, ineffective, frustratingly so, and in a way that we all need to focus on addressing. Beatrice. Um, next question, and this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, did you support the last session's climate bill? And what do you think were its main strengths and weaknesses? And this question is for you, Erica, first. Awesome. Um, so we passed two versions of the climate bill. One was on the House side and one was on the Senate side. Uh, both had some very good strengths in, as well, and there was also provisions in the Econ Development Bill. Um, these were all provisions that I supported, uh, and I'll just highlight a few that are particularly important. Um, Somerville wants to go fossil free. Uh, the last climate bill only allowed 10 municipalities to do so, and right now we're fighting for the 10th slot. And there was something in the bill that would have made it, right, so that we wouldn't have to fight over 10 slots with Northampton, that we'd be able to actually have 11 um, communities actually going with a gas, you know, ga um, gas infrastructure removed, uh, you know, moving forward for new construction. It's called the stretch code, and we want to make sure that it actually gets implemented, and we are able to do it here in Somerville. Um, and that's one piece that's in the bill. There's another piece as well of investing hundreds of millions of dollars into the clean energy uh, fund and the clean energy climate um, initiatives. So those are uh, initiatives that it's why we have Greentown Labs, right? It's why we have investment in research and technology. It's also way, uh, ways that we can actually improve things like mass saves, right? Right now, mass save is is, doesn't go far enough, to say the least, and that's something that the bill moved forward very well, mm -hmm. as well as investing in uh, heat pumps, advanced metering, as well as electric vehicles. So there's a lot of good things in the bill. Um, I think the main weakness is that we have until 2030. The IPCC gave us until 2030, so while these are really important steps in the right direction, I'm proud that we've passed th three legislation in the past um, few years when we didn't do anything until 2008. We are moving faster, but it's not fast enough. Um, Kathleen, uh, did you support the last session's climate bill? I know you weren't a representative then. Um, and what do you think were its main strengths and weaknesses? And if you want to focus on strengths and weaknesses because when you, you weren't in the House at that time, uh, you, can be, you can take some liberty right. in that well, one. Well, I am always happy to support climate legislation, and it was something I was very much engaged in as a staffer. Um, I think some of the strengths of this bill were including environmental justice communities more su substantially in decisions around siting. That was a big piece that was very important to include and hopefully they will still move ahead with that, as well as reducing the exploitative impact of, of um, electrical suppliers who prey on folks with low incomes. This is something that actually one of my neighbors, uh, Dr. Anna Goldman, brought to the attention of Senator Jalen, who included it in a recent newsletter, because it is a public health issue as well as an environmental issue. Folks who have to pay exorbitant amounts for electrical supply can't afford to pay for other really necessary public health um, supplies like food, medication, housing. It increases the inst instability and insecurity of already very vulnerable residents. I think, in addition, one of the strengths that was um, in the Senate version was moving, again, more quickly away from fossil fuels. We have really important, as Representative Eiderhoven mentioned, really important goals we have set for ourselves. We need to be moving towards them urgently, and this is something that I'm going to prioritize in my work next session. Thank you. Ryan? So one of you is going to be returned to the State House or elected to serve in the State House, and you hope to be appointed to some committees. And so, Kathleen, what are the three committees that you would like to be appointed to if you're elected as our state rep? Thanks, Fred. This is also a tough one because I am such a big nerd. I'm like, I want to be on all of the committees. <laughs> but I will pick um, housing, public health, and transportation. 
um, because again, these are these are related to the challenges we see very acutely here in Somerville, as well as across the Commonwealth. Um, I think it's incredibly important to be using every tool at our disposal to continue pushing for increased housing supply, access, and affordability and being on the housing committee will give me an opportunity to do that while focusing on the needs specific to Somerville. I also was fortunate enough to work for the chair of the public health committee for the last several years and realized how broad that subject is. It's maternal health, it's newborn screening, it's end of life care, it's about ambulance services, stroke care. There is so much work to be done there. And again, all of this relates to challenges that we see in Somerville that Somerville residents are facing around health care access, equity, and affordability. And finally, transportation, we need to be very forward thinking around sustainably funding the T, making sure we have access to reliable bus programs, hopefully instituting a fare free bus program, and making sure that our streets are safe for everyone using them, whether they are walking, cycling, driving, uh, or riding public transit. Perfect. Thank you. Erica, what three committees do you want to be appointed to? Yeah. Well, I'm very fortunate because actually I would say two of them I'm already appointed to. Uh, first is the Committee on Revenue. Um, like I said, money is everything, right? If you don't fund it, we're just talking about ideas and we're not actually making it happen. So um, raising revenue is really foundational to all of our needs, whether it's funding our public schools, fixing the MBTA, investing in affordable housing and public housing, um, and the list goes on as well as expanding mass health so that we can finally have Medicare for all as a state. These are all things that rely on having sustainable revenue sources. So I really personally just enjoy so much being on that committee because we can look for those revenue sources, do those changes. And I just want to highlight one piece of legislation that is still moving forward, hopefully, and it has not been sent to study, which is the payment in lieu of taxes so that Tufts University, Harvard College, and all of the other hospitals and schools are paying their fair share in taxes to our municipal governments. That makes a big difference in terms of our municipal budgets. Um, I'm also very honored to serve on the Elder Affairs Committee. I know that's seen as sort of a less uh, well-known topic, but it's true that our elders are oftentimes rendered invisible and all of the issues that they face and we have put forward really powerful legislation around regulating nursing homes ensuring that we actually have home care and supporting our elders in our community um, the last one that I would ask for that I'm not on is the judiciary so the judiciary uh, handles the most number of bills and especially as we know the Supreme Court is going to compete con continue doing what they do that's a committee that's going to tackle all the bills around reproductive justice and protecting our rights as citizens and our human dignity Thank you. Um, and to all of us, let's be louder. Um, uh, the next question is for you, <laughs> Erica. Uh, this is on policy. Uh, nearly half the students in the Somerville school system are Latino. UMass Boston Mauricio Gaston Institute recently found that Latino students are lagging behind in our state school system. Louder. What changes to Chapter 70A funding would you propose to help level the economic divide between school systems? Thank you so much for that question because um, I'm extremely proud of the work we've done so far, but it also has highlighted how much work there is to be done. To just give you a context, the last time before 2018 we passed the Student Opportunity Act, the previous bill that we passed on educational funding formula was 1994. We cannot wait an entire generation before we equitably fund our schools further. I'm proud of what we did with the Student Opportunity Act. It brought in $1.5 billion more dollars into a more equitable funding formula that takes into account whether students are either low income, gateway communities, English language learners, as well as whether there's a number of special needs students. So that is a really critical formula that we need to, uh, to invest in further because we know that the, our educators are not being paid enough. It is not sustainable. We need to be investing in smaller class sizes as well as before and after school programs that support all students, but particularly it helps students of color and students who are not English language learners in gateway communities, um, including Somerville, which we have a high number of, um, of, of new, newly arrived immigrants. Um, the last thing I'll add to is we need to be investing in Head Start and uh, pre-K and childcare. I'm proud of the 1.5 
additional billion dollars that we've put into that um, to have a more equitable funding. Because right now, uh, that is not even an option for many families, and particularly, again, families of color and Latino families. So those are some of the things that we've done, and we just really need to magnify all of those, double, triple the amount, because we're seeing the impact of it. Thank you. Kathleen, would you like me to repeat the question? Nearly half of the students in the Somerville school system are Latino. UMass Boston Mauricio Gaston Institute recently found that Latino students are lagging behind in our state school system. What changes to the Chapter 70A funding would you propose to help level the economic divide between school systems? Thanks, Bea. One of the reasons that we, uh, many of us as parents, many of the people in this room were outside City Hall advocating for fully funding Somerville Public Schools this year was because we could not get, and we were not alone in this, get fully funded Chapter 70 um, foundation funds because despite the Student Opportunity Act, inflation rate in the foundation fund remains capped at 4.5%. We all know that inflation over the last couple of years has been way above that. In order for us to get the funding for Somerville and every school across the state that it deserves and should be getting through the Student Opportunity Act, we need to lift that inflation cap and increase the, min the aid amount per pupil. Um, in addition to making changes to Chapter 70, because there's only so much districts can do once they get that funding, we also need to focus on who is most in need in our district. We need to focus on why, not only who is chronically absent, but why, not only who is falling behind, but why. That means supporting and hiring bilingual teachers who represent the uh, communities that they are serving, investing more in out of school time programs, and making sure that we are taking a systemic public health approach to these issues and not dismissing them as kids skipping class. Okay. <clears throat> Kathleen, this question is for you. You have served as a staffer in the State House for almost a decade. And in different ways, you and Erica have both been part of the legislative process. Could you speak to a time that a bill that you wrote uh, was passed into law and the process that you undertook to help make that happen? Absolutely. I've been fortunate to work for two very effective legislators, and part of a legislative staffer's role is drafting, amending, and advancing legislation. Um, so a recent example um, is one of the recommendations from the Racial Inequities in Maternal Health Commission report. That was strengthening and expanding the Massachusetts Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee, which is a mouthful. Uh, we initially filed that as an amendment in the FY23 budget and after consulting with a range of stakeholders, including healthcare providers, and it wasn't included, so we filed it as a bill at the beginning of the legislative session. When we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to move it forward as a bill, we redrafted it a little bit, worked with DPH, filed it again as a budget amendment, and it was signed into the budget and became law. This was after discussions with leadership in the House, all these providers we'd been working with, advocates, people who had experienced maternal loss and complications, and making sure that we were using every strategy and opportunity available to us to move this forward. And once something is signed into the budget, it's law, and then you don't have to worry about time running out at the end of the session. So that is still on the books. Thank you. <clears throat> Erica, you have served in the State House for four years. <coughs> Could you speak to a, a time that a bill that you wrote or advocated for was passed into law and the process that you undertook mm -hmm. to help make that happen. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to highlight a very technical issue around taxes, which is around the estate tax. Um, I worked with Raise Up Massachusetts, which is a massive coalition of labor and community organizations and faith organizations that fought for increasing taxes on the wealthy and tried to stop the tax cuts that Governor Baker initially introduced in his last term and that unfortunately Governor Healy took up subsequently after while she was on the campaign. Within some of those tax cuts was, I would call, the worst tax cut in terms of generational wealth. 
because the estate tax is about generational wealth. And we hear all the time about the racial wealth gap, right? The immense amount of wealth inequality and inherited wealth. This is a tax cut that will make our state less equal and less, um, it'll be more unequal than ever before. Um, and it's, so that was the by far the most regressive component. And of the regressive tax cuts that were put forward, it was the largest in terms of dollar value. Um, I propose an amendment working with the Raise Up Ma uh, Massachusetts. It was originally a bill, but then it was an amendment on various versions of this bill um, that essentially made that formula less regressive. Um, it is the most regressive because it gives the most tax, tax breaks to people who are inheriting literally millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. They get the best uh, pie, and we made that less regressive, and it made the final package of the tax cuts, which unfortunately did ultimately move forward, but they were far less regressive than the initial draft that Governor Baker put forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, this is another policy question. Uh, both candidates before us tonight are pro-choice. And the Massachusetts legislator, legislatures, my apologies, codified the right to abortion with, Roe, with the Roe Act in 2020. What have you done or will you do next session to expand, fund, protect access to reproductive health care? This one's for you, Erica. Great. Um, yeah, I'm incredibly proud of what we've done um, in Massachusetts for reproductive justice, um, but there's more work we need to do, and actually one of the bills that unfortunately made it so close to the finish line and didn't pass is something called the Location Shield Act. Right now, people can sell your location data to whoever they want, and particularly if you are visiting, say, an abortion clinic or you're an LGBTQIA person trying to get gender-affirming care, People can target you, and particularly in a post-Dobbs world, this is critical. Um, and so this is a legislation that was put forth by Planned Parenthood and ACLU. I worked very hard to get that, and it just made it to the end of the finish line. I'm, that is why I'm calling for us to have a special uh, legislative session so that we can get this over the finish line. That is one really cool, uh, crucial part of protecting reproductive justice. The second thing I'll highlight is gestational limits. Um, in Massachusetts, until we passed the, recently, um, the most recent reproductive justice law following the Dobbs decision, women who had to get a third trimester abortion still had to fly out of state to Colorado or Maryland to access care. That is obscene. People should be able to get the care they need, and that decision should be between a, pers a person, a pregnant person, and their doctor. That is it. And that is why I believe in removing gestational limits altogether and that we need to codify abortion rights in the Massachusetts Constitution so that there are no questions around, is this person qualified? Are they sick enough? All of these things, again, should be decided between a doctor and a patient. Kathleen, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. Uh, both candidates before us tonight are pro-choice, and the Massachusetts legislature codified the right to abortion with the Roe Act in 2020. What have you done, or will you do next session, to expand, fund, and protect access to reproductive health care? Thank you. I've been directly involved in securing state budget earmarks for family planning programs since 2007 and more recently for birth centers and maternal health care, which are all part of reproductive justice. I've also worked directly on legislation to establish a standing order for emergency contraception at all pharmacies in Massachusetts, and to require public colleges and universities to develop medication abortion readiness plans, both of which were in the omnibus legislation that the Massachusetts legislature passed after Roe fell. More recently, I helped file legislation that would expand access to telehealth, which is a missing piece in a lot of our health equity gaps, but also very important for ensuring that everyone has access to abortion care when and where they need it. And it is also one of the priority bills of reproductive rights organizations in this state. And that's something that I will continue to fight for. We also need to fund awareness of fake abortion clinics that take advantage of people who are hoping to find support and resources when they find they are pregnant. This is something that a lot of local, especially Christian Strezzo locally, um, worked to advance after Rofel, but statewide there are still a lot of these clinics out there. They are not providing the health care that people who are pregnant need, and we need to make sure that 
people are aware of their existence and are guided to places that they could actually receive abortion services. Thank you, Kathleen. We just have three more questions. How are we doing? What about these candidates? Yeah. And you've been incredibly quiet and cooperative given the fact that the pizzas came late. So I really want to applaud uh, everybody here from Somerville that's uh, behaved very un Somerville. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> What, uh, this is for you, Kathleen, what three things would you say that Somerville, that our city needs from the legislature in the next session? And what would be your priority uh, in the State House in the next legislative session? What does Somerville need? Housing. <laughs> and I know that from not only the advocates who speak to me, but again, going door to door every day, I ask voters what is the most important issue to them in this race and what they most want to see their state representative working on. And nine times out of 10, the answer is housing. We have not gone far enough to boost our supply, to increase access and affordability. So I would work to secure funding for Somerville's municipal voucher program, which I think is fantastic, but only has a couple of years of funding and provides vouchers to pro people who would not otherwise be eligible. So it allows them to stay in our community and afford their rent. And we need to make sure that that continues. I would also increase funding and access to programs like RAFT and Home Base that relieve pressure on our shelter system. And again, directly help people in this community and allow them to stay in their homes rather than facing um, the shelter system, which is already, as we know, operating well beyond capacity. I also think Somerville needs an overdose prevention center and needs to move faster on that. And, and I think, Bayer, you might remember when I said that to you when you first came and knocked on my door. There is statewide enabling legislation for a 10 municipality pilot that I would push for and a study that goes along with it. So Somerville would not be alone, but that is something that we need to move ahead with. And lastly, access to out-of-school programs and affordable childcare. Got that in there. Yes, I did. Okay, Erica, what would your three, I'm sorry, what, what do you think Somerville most needs in the next legislative session? Um, I would say in terms of what we're responsible for at the State House is fixing the MBTA and making transit a human right, accessible, free, and reliable, and fully functioning. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the steps we've taken so far, particularly under new management, as well as the additional over $380 million per year that's going into the MBTA uh, because of more progressive taxation. Um, the second thing I'll highlight is, of course, housing policy and truly affordable housing policy. I'm proud of the one, uh, the several billion dollars that we're investing into more affordable housing as well as public housing, but we need to do more than just that. We need to have real policy changes around the tenant's opportunity to purchase, the transfer fee, and rent stabilization. Those are all policies that are actually going to help support tenants and residents in Somerville be able to stay here and to have permanently affordable housing be part of our day-to-day -day life. Um, the last thing I'll say is around funding for our schools, uh, and I mean that from pre-K all the way up to debt-free higher ed. Um, we, I'm really proud that we've made some immense progress with childcare and pre-K, because if you talk to any parent, the next big expense after paying rent or their mortgage is childcare. Um, and so that is something that, while we've made a really big step in the right direction for equity, I wanna make it so that if you make under $120,000 as a family, childcare is virtually free up until you are 11 years old. And that is something that a vision we've put forward as a legislature, let's execute on that vision. Uh, and of course, certainly funding for our K through 12 schools and our public higher education system. Next question. Two more to go, and I realize I have to talk like a teenager in a cafeteria. Um, the city of Somerville sent the number of home rule petitions to the state house in, in the last year. Most were not adopted. What would you do to advance them in the next session? Erica? 
Um, that is true. We're very proud of the fact that our city has submitted the most home rule petition and they raise, range from issues around housing, voting rights, um, as well as some of the more minor things around reapproving, you know, the police chief, right? So there's all these things that unfortunately the state legislature and the state house prevent the, the city of Somerville from doing. Um, I think that we need to continue to build across the state. Um, that's exactly what we've done with the transfer fee. It is something, a home rule petition that no longer is the only Somerville home rule petition, but it's being filed across the state and we need to build that momentum. The same thing for also um, undocumented immigrants' ability to vote in municipal elections is something that Somerville first introduced and we're seeing them taken up in more and more um, cities. Um, a lot of these issues, because they're local options, means that we're not imposing those policy changes, but they're actually policy changes that we can take up if given the option to do so. Um, the last one I want to also highlight, because we are in a community school, um, but I know at the high school we could have our high school students voting in municipal elections when they're 16 years old. That's another home rule petition that we've put forth as Somerville, something that again, I know that the, uh, raise, the, the age, um, voting age a campaign has been pushing to pass in other municipalities across the state. So that is the first step, but I think ultimately it is going to come down to making our legislature less, uh, sorry, more transparent and more accountable to the people of across the Commonwealth. Thank you. Kathleen, I'll repeat the question. The city of Somerville sent a number of home rule petitions to the state house in the last year. Most were not adopted. What would you do to advance them in the next session? Thanks. Uh, it will probably surprise no one in this audience that Cambridge also loves to send a lot of home rule petitions to the State House. So this is something I have a lot of experience with. Um, some of them, like the real estate transfer fee, are similar to what Somerville has proposed. Others, like establishing a fire cadet program, are different and we were able to get through in addition to um, a home rule petition making it easier for folks in condo associations and homeowners associations to set up electric vehicle charging stations. There is a really tricky process for getting home rule petitions through, especially because you can't change the language from what was sent to you by the city. So you have to make sure you are working with each committee that it is sent to along each step of the way to clarify what any concerns are and if there need to be changes very early, sending it back to the city so it can be reapproved and come back to the state house to move forward. And this is something that I've had to work on before. And because it is only for a municipality, it's that much harder to get attention to it. So you really have to stay on top of it and make sure you have those ongoing conversations both with the city and with the committee chairs and occasionally with house counsel to address any concerns at any point through the process and keep pushing them forward at every stage until they are signed into law. Okay, last question. I don't know about you, but we've heard a lot of policy speak tonight. And honestly, I'm kind of confused about what the difference is between these two candidates. They both sound terrific. So I'm going to ask each candidate to say to us what distinguishes you from the other candidate running for this seat. You know, what makes you different? What makes you uh, extraordinary and capa more capable of representing the 27th Middlesex District in the State House? Kathleen? As I mentioned, I know the legislative process inside and out. I dream in budget spreadsheets. This is my bread and butter. I will hammer away at every stage of the legislative process, turning good ideas into good bills, getting other legislators on board, working with organizations outside the state house, backing up my proposals with data, bringing in people whose stories demonstrate the personal impact of the issue, finding journalists who will cover it, and taking advantage of every opportunity to move something forward. That's one thing. That's how you handle the legislative process. Two, I'll show up for hearings and votes, spending hours in hearing rooms and on the House floor so that I can learn, ask questions, and show my commitment to every aspect of this job. And three, I will fight for people instead of platforms and agendas. Rather than being beholden to political organizations, I will answer to the people who live and work in the district and in the Commonwealth. Thank you, Kathleen. 
Erica, what distinguishes you from the other candidate? Yeah. I think our main distinguishing difference is our leadership style. And what I mean by that is I believe that we cannot pa pass all of the important legislation without working across the straight seats as the state across coalitions and with the power of organized labor, community organizations and people across making the pressure and uh, issues known to the legislature. Um, you cannot just stop caring and then expect us to handle it behind closed doors. Power and has never conceded anything without a demand, and we know that. Um, and so I think what I bring is this lens from my work as an activist and an advocate, and now in the legislature to actually bridge that gap so that we're pushing for those changes. And I'll give a few examples because I think a lot of this has already taken place in the past few years. Um, until I entered the, uh, my, my role, for 17 years we made no changes to the transparency rules, and we finally made some committee votes public. And after that, and that great groundswell of a campaign that happened across the state with targeted um, ensuring that we're actually pushing legislators on all these specific issues, we finally passed an immigrant justice bill, the Work and Family Mobility Act, after 20 years of stagnation and after 16 other states had already surpassed us. On climate change, we did nothing since 2008, and then in my first term, we passed two, not just one, but two climate bills into law. And finally, with public education, we did nothing since 1994, and in 2018, because um, unions across the state organized, we were able to change the law in 2018, and we'll push for that again. Thank you. Thank you. Again, now we will have one minute for closing statements before we move there. I want to acknowledge that we're here in a school building and someone's going to clean up after us, a city employee, so we want to thank them. I think he's quietly sitting in the corner. Oh. Um, I just want to remind us all. We're all one big community and we're interconnected and many people make this possible. So I want to acknowledge the schools, you know, they're maintained every day, they're kept every day. So everybody, this is my speech, support municipal workers. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, I'm giving you both uh, a minute. We will start with Erica. So core to my work and all of the work in democracy is that we must work together because nothing gets done alone in the State House. I'm proud of working with you all, with the Somerville Legislative Delegation, city elected officials and community organizations and voters like you to get that done. And we know how to do that. Together, we've successfully voted to increase millionaires tax to fund the T and our schools. It's why we have universal free community college. We have equitable investment in childcare and pre-K and free school meals across the state. Um, when Roe v. Wade was struck down, we also acted swiftly to codify, protect and expand access to abortion to the life-saving reproductive care and gender affirming care. And when MAGA Republicans in Massachusetts tried to roll back immigrant rights, we organized, mobilized, knocked on doors to ensure that the Work and Family Mobility Act became law. I reject the notion that representing the most progressive district in a deep blue state like Massachusetts means that as long as we vote the right way, take the right progressive positions and check the boxes, that things are okay. They are not, and I'm committed to doing whatever it takes to fight for progressive causes and build a transparent and accountable government that works for you. There are no problems that are too big or too small, whether it's helping individuals navigate the state and local uh, services or standing up to the U.S. Supreme Court assault against our fundamental human rights. I am committed to working hard to deliver for Somerville and for Massachusetts. And that is why I humbly ask for your vote in the Democratic primary on September 3rd. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Okay. Kathleen? Yep. I'm going to say thank you again to the Somerville Democratic City Committee for organizing this event, for Rand and Bea for moderating, uh, SCA TV for recording, and everyone who came out tonight and sat very patiently as we all made our points. I just want to say it has been a tremendous honor to work in the State House on increasing cash benefits for the first time in decades, increasing the earned income tax credit so from one of the lowest in the country to now among the highest, working towards a child and family tax credit, to all of which put money back in people's pockets, as well as expanding access to behavioral health care, improving maternal health outcomes, and working to include um, 
items in our most two recent uh, climate bills to move us toward a just transition to clean energy. I have been honored to work with AFL-CIO and other labor organizations, Reproductive Record Now and other reproductive health organizations with Boston Medical Center, the ACLU, and every progressive organization in this state on legislation that I have worked to draft, helped to file, updated, amended, and seen become law in my years as a legislative staffer. I have done this work for two Cambridge representatives. I love doing it. I want to keep doing it, but I want to do it for you. I want to do this work for Somerville, where I live, where I'm raising my family, and where we deserve somebody who will work for us and fight for us in the State House and get us the progressive results we need while pushing for reform. So, okay, before Jack comes up to close it up, I just want to ask the people under 30, if you're under 30, stand up. Let's give the young people here a round of applause for showing up at this event. <laughs>